So good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Stringer. Uh, I'm the history editor of Airways Magazine. Uh, I'm also a member of the editorial board of a British publication called The Aviation Historian. And today we're going to we're here talking with uh, Captain Baker Watson. He was a training captain for British Airways, retired now. Uh, Dave and I have been friends for 30 plus years, I think. And, and Dave is also a member of the editorial board for the Aviation Historian. But today we're going to talk about um, a bit about his career and the uh, aircraft that he flew and his, his very interesting life story. And then we're going to get into uh, the associate carriers of British Airways. We're going to focus on Aiden Airways. Dacre wrote this book called Red Sea Caravan, uh, which is uh, what an Air Britain publication. It's a, just a lovely book, but it's probably one of the most thorough uh, stories of a small airline that you'll ever come across. And it's just filled with information, black and white, color photos. He researched it beautifully. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about why Aiden Airways. And um, anyway, let's get started. Daker, can you give us a little bit about, uh, tell us about uh, well, how you got interested in aviation? Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, it all really started when I was very young. Um, though I speak English quite nicely. <laughs> um, I, in fact, was third generation children. And uh, my family went out from Europe, from Norway, in the 1870s to Chile. And um, that is really where I was born and brought up. And my father went out there at the age of 21, met my mother, and lived happily ever after, so they say. But um, in 1938, when my parents first got married, um, they were sent up to Bolivia to live in La Paz. And, um, which is really where, where they loved it. They lived at 13,000 feet. And uh, I was born in 1943 in, in Barbara, in Chile. Went straight up to La Paz. And um, it was really a flight there when I was four years old from La Paz to Cochabamba on a Lloyd Aéreo Boliviano uh, DC-3. And I remember it so vividly. And um, we sat beside the engine and I was absolutely mesmerized. And airplanes were a large feature of all my life then. We eventually went back to Chile to live when I was about seven or eight years old. And my father had to travel a great deal. Um, uh, I worked working for a mining company called Hoshi. And uh, he traveled north and south and went east uh, on land Chile internally up to our mines up in the Atacama Desert and also up to New York where the headquarters was, and New York's still on Panagra. And the airport was very small in those days, maybe seven or eight airplanes at the time. And um, I used to go out early to meet him when he was coming back. My mother was very kind to me. And uh, when he left, we would stay on for a couple of hours to see airplanes go. And it was really seeing all the Douglas airplanes um, as I grew up, and all I wanted to be I was in there my mind. Dacre's father took this photo, it's not a postcard. I made him take this photograph. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a camera. And uh, Panagra was the dominant airline, and it was a uh, uh, height of safety and reliability, and really did much to open uh, the west coast of Latin America. Uh, the next airplane that uh, really featured in our lives was the DC-4 of the Niagara that used to come down through from Miami uh, all the way through Lima, through Arica and uh, Paracta and down to Santiago. And it was uh, quite, I, ju I just couldn't get enough of it. And the BOAC engineer who was our next door neighbor on Saturday mornings used to take, us, take me down to the airport for the arrival of the Argonaut um, airplane, the DC-4 that was pressurized, and I could spend the day with him. How old were you then? I was about eight. Oh. And uh, he, uh, he was a wonderful mentor. But the following airplane that came in was the DC-6, 
96 because we used to travel to Norway quite a lot. And in fact, I've been on this very one when we flew to Norway in 1956. It was, as you can see there, uh, it was a sleeper all the way. It took four days to get from Santiago to uh, Oslo, uh, Buenos Aires, Montevideo, Rio, Recife, Dakar, Lisbon, Madrid, Geneva, Frankfurt, Copenhagen, Gothenburg, and Oslo. Long way. Let me interject that his mother was Norwegian. That was funny. And so, um, uh, it, to me, I was in seventh heaven. Inside Chile, we traveled a great deal, north and south, and this was now Chile, DC-6B, and it was always my intention to fly for land and hopefully transfer to Panagra. But of course, um, that sort of thing didn't exist because I wasn't an American citizen. And um, that was life, but nevertheless, I was hoping to come and fly for land Chile one day. And eventually, um, I got sent to England because I was screwing up my education rather badly. I had an utter indifference towards my teachers, and this was reciprocated in equal measure. <laughs> and I was about to be thrown out of school. So my father sent me to his own school, which was up in the northwest of England, a very tough school, founded in 1583, and gives you an idea when Fletcher Christian of Mutiny on the Bounty was a former pupil, and also Rowan Atkinson of Mr. Bean. And, and anyway, I used to travel backwards and forwards a great deal on the, the DC-6s, DC-6Bs, and eventually the DC-7C. And I'm only showing you this photograph of the brand new DC-7C because we're in Texas. <laughs> and I thought that was one of the most beautiful color schemes and it was the first of the really good, wilder, and imaginative color schemes. I thought it was wonderful. So, um, as I said before, I was sent to this very progressive school. And um, they were people who thought out of the box. And we had one particular teacher, in fact we called them masters because it was very formal. And he talked me into applying for a flying scholarship from the Royal Air Force. And uh, this was available to schoolboys. And um, I thought, well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And I applied for it, went for some interviews uh, with the Air Force, did all their aptitude tests, and it absolutely amazed me. I was actually offered a scholarship. So in April 1961, and this shows you how old I am, in April 1961, at the age of 17, I learned to fly on the tag of moth. And uh, this is me the day I went solo. I had quite a trip. Um, trust me, it's not like that anymore. And um, it took three weeks to get the private pilot's license. I had 30 hours, and I went back to school as a pilot. Um, and at school, they had an Air Force CCF section. And uh, combined cadet force, I think it's your OTC in this country. And I kept my license going by taking all the masters flying at different times um, because they, most of them had never been in an airplane, which explains why they trusted me. And uh, I managed to build up my hours by 10 hours in my last year at school. And things were getting better. And uh, so um, I applied to go to Hamburg. Now this was the school that the OAC and the British European Airways that they set up in the end of 1960 because they could see that there was a huge pilot shortage. And um, I think I was very lucky at that time because uh, they were very short of pilots. And I managed to get in and in January 1963 I went to Hamble, the College of Air Training at Hamble. Uh, with a guaranteed job at the end of it, doing a degree course in uh, aero, aero engineering, plus learning to fly, plus learning to navigate, and learning all the things about being a pilot, and an engineer as well, which was quite difficult for me because I majored in English literature and French literature and failed my mathematics many times. Nevertheless, I got in and uh, fortuitously, 
I even got through. Of the 45 of us who started, 22 graduated, and um, I counted myself very lucky to get through. I was told by David not to explain why I was so lucky. But the airplanes we used with the Dade Havilland Canada Chipmunk, which was a wonderful airplane. Uh, we flew two days a week. We were in ground school for the rest of the time. We had four weeks holiday a year, and it was very, very hard work. I, um, I must be honest, actually. I can't say I enjoyed it, but I loved the flying, and that was the easy bit. So the Chipmunk, we did 150 hours, uh, of which 10 hours was aerobatic training, because in those days, many airplanes were in fact losing control uh, because of poor instrument flying. And we could recover by the time, at the end of it, from all attitudes under the hood, just on basic panel. And I think it stood me in a very good stead for the future. So after the 150 hours, we, stand by, we moved to, to the advanced training, the Piper Apache, the PA-23, two 160 horsepower engines, and on that airplane, apart from the basic learning to fly, learning single engine approaches and go-rounds and landings, it was all airways work, done to the standard operating procedures of British European Airways. And that is, I think, the big secret, uh, because there's a great deal of discussion in this country about having a minimum of 1,500 hours before you can fly for a major airline. Well, when I graduated, in fact, all of us graduated from Handel, we had 250 hours, and in my case, I had 280 because I'd done the 30 hours flying in the private pilot's license. And we went straight from there. I remember we finished on a Friday afternoon, and we started at British European Airways the next Monday. It was that sort of production. And I went on to Sorry, this is uh, where we trained. I have to go back a bit. This is the pub where we went down to every Saturday night and got pissed because that was the best thing to do. We weren't allowed girls into the college. It was policed. And uh, if it was, that's where we met the occasional girl. Not very often. And we were considered far too immature. So I graduated and I went to British Airways, or BEA, to fly the Vickers Vanguard. And you have no idea how big that airplane was. But it was 58 tons at max weight, it could fly for eight hours. We could go all the way from London to Gibraltar, lose an engine on approach, do a go around, and fly back on three all the way to London. Just to give you an idea what that airplane could do. And it was a wonderful learning machine. But because of the training I had at Handel, it made it the uh, change very, very easy. Uh, we did about uh, 15 hours on base training uh, down in Malta on uh, four engine, three engine, and two engine landings. And once again, I have to say the training was very good and it was very straightforward. And it was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful, but there was a problem, and that was that when I arrived at the uh, and all with all my mates, there were seven of us by this stage, um, they wouldn't accept me. And the reason for that was I didn't have a British passport, and nobody had told me, and nobody had asked me for, for a passport. And so they uh, they said, go away which was actually quite difficult, quite disheartening after those two very hard years. I didn't want to go back to Chile. So there was only one airline, and I couldn't work for any other airline in, in uh, England or in Great Britain. There was only one airline that would accept me, and that was Aiden Airways. Um, Aiden Airways worked out in the Aiden, obviously, and it was considered quite a dangerous place. The salary I would get uh, was twice what I would have got in British Airways or in PDA. Would you believe it? I was getting £800 a year, which at the time was about $1,500 a year tax. In, in Aden, it would be £2,000 a year and untaxed. 
So there it is. Well, about 10 days before I went down to Aden, um, uh, BEA rang me up and they said, look, we're very short of pilots. We would quite like to have you. And I had to point out to them that it was them who said no to me, rather than me to them. And they said, well, I'll tell you what, uh, we'll give you British nationality if you come and join us, we'll propose you. And I thought, yeah, I'll do that. You know, one passport's as good as another. And uh, they were as good as they were, and I joined and flew the Bengal, which was a wonderful airplane. Is there anything you want to say? Well, you're happy? No, I'm happy. <laughs> um, well, he's my, he's my boss. And um, so I, had, I um, flew the Bengal, that's me. Flying the Bengal with hair on board. And one strike, because we were second officers, and very much looked down upon by not only senior captains, who were twice our age at 45. When that photograph was taken, I was 20. Did you say they called you P2? P2 and P2? They didn't call us by our names, thank you for that. They called us P2, the right hand seat, or P3, if you sat in the third seat. We flew the Vanguard with three crew. Um, it was a wonderful training airplane. We did four sectors a day. Uh, two in the right hand seat, two in the left, in the third seat. So we would get at least one landing a day. Some captains wouldn't get any landings away at all because we were far too inexperienced. You remember we had less than 300 hours at this stage. But because of the training, it was very straightforward and I found the airplane beautiful. It was a very big cockpit, you can see the windows there. And um, that just gives you an idea of what Heathrow looked like on a night in uh, winter, the vanguards all over the place, and they were lovely to fly. They really were. I did five years on them as a co-pilot, had a wonderful time, and um, that's me on the left hand side, <laughs> about 23. And um, life was fabulous. I'd become the first officer by then. Uh, the guy, the other first officer there is Alan Jenkins. He and I were on the same course at Hamble, and we still know each other some 60 odd years later. So it was like that. The skipper was uh, coming up to 47, 48. He'd flown Lancaster bombers during the war. And he was charming, one of the nicest people I know. That was that taken down in Gibraltar. Um, we didn't fly high, we flew at 17,000 feet. And uh, that meant you flew over the uh, Alps, where the Mont Blanc is 15,000 feet. And we had a very good view. It was lovely. Life was brilliant. As I said before, I did five years on the Vanguard. And then they were very short of co pilots on the Viscount. And they asked the volunteers to go to the Viscount. I wanted to go to the Trident, but I didn't think I was going to get a course that year, done on seniority. So I said I'd go to the Viscount, and we flew the German internals, and this was 1970, and we flew the German internals uh, because at that time Berlin was divided, and it was one of the most exciting and interesting bits of flying that we had. Now the Viscount didn't have radar on it, weather radar, and that's significant, because if the ra weather radar was unserviceable, the aircraft couldn't go if there were known to be thunderstorms. So BEA said, well, we won't put radar in. So in that case, you can go every time. And it was could be quite hairy fine because we flew at 3,000 feet in the corridor. And uh, that was quite a long way from the border to Berlin itself. I had a year, I was the most senior co-pilot on the Viscount. I had a year uh, on that. And then I went uh, to the Trident as a co-pilot. And I think the Trident is one of the most beautiful airplanes there is. Uh, the Trident 3 was a bit nicer, but I wasn't flying it at the time. Uh, the Trident 3 was at stone 11 feet. And uh, we went as far west, uh, sorry, as far east as Tel Aviv, Nicosia, Athens, Istanbul, and all over Europe. And it was very glamorous, and I loved it. This was in 1971. In 1972, I became a training co-pilot, an instructor of new co-pilots joining 
just showing them around what, what happens. By this time, I had about 4,000 hours. I'd done six years, seven years in the company, and we were starting to be considered quite senior. And the most notable indication of that was that captains called us by our name. I know, it, it, you, have to, you have to love. Well, in 1974, I became a captain um, uh, at the age of 29. On, back on the Vanguard, I won't show you, it's just another picture. And uh, a year later, I became a training captain, monitor examiner, type rating examiner as well. And I decided that I would stay in training for the rest of my career if I could. And after three years on the Vanguard, uh, with a lot of training going on, I moved back to the Trident and uh, became a training captain a year later on that. And uh, I did, in fact, quite a while there. I did seven years, uh, of which six were in training. And uh, I enjoyed the job very much. We did a lot of flying, it was hands on, and uh, three or four months a year in the simulators. The rest was flying quite hard, about 600 hours a year. But it was a lot of fun, it was a hot ship. We could do auto lands in zero zero by the time I left it, which and none of the other European airlines had auto land to that capacity. We were zero zero. And we got picked off with we rules on time. And BEA was a very good airline. I was very proud to work for them. Let's move on. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, my apologies. Then I went on 737, there were short instructors, and uh, I had uh, three years on the 737 before I went off to, to the 747 Classic, which was another big change, but it was quite going backwards quite a few steps because it was so old-fashioned in the cockpit and the systems were so old-fashioned. But it was a nice position to be in, I was a training captain on that, and in 1989, I was on the first course of training captains to go and fly, uh, learn to fly, and the 74400. And we went off to Seattle to do the course, and then we spent the rest of the next three years teaching everybody else how to do it. And this was a nice one going around the checkerboard at Hong Kong for the IGS. And that was always the most exciting thing. It's the one landing I never gave away, <laughs> unless I was training the captain, which I had to give it away then. And uh, like all good things, it came to an end. I got kicked out of British Airways at the age of 55, or old age, and I was too young to retire, and I went on to Singapore Airlines. And that was a very interesting job, uh, learning how to work with the Chinese, who were, uh, is anybody Chinese in here? No. In the front uh, row. In the front row. <laughs> well, you're not Chinese, you're not Chinese from Singapore. <laughs> um, Can I interject? Let me interject. British Airways had a mandatory retirement age of 55, correct. whereas Singapore Airlines had a mandatory retirement age of 60, 60. which is why the transfer. Yeah. And I never realized that the same airplane could be flown so differently. But I had a wonderful time then, uh, five years. My wife and I lived in Spain, and I commuted to work. we eight days on, eight days off. It was uh, very, very pleasant. Uh, and then I retired uh, completely. And I only show you that, that was 42 years between the first one and the last one. The one, the one on the right looks a little old, but there you are. And I, I carry on, I'm still flying. I'm, uh, I've had this Piper Tri Pacer for 30 years, and uh, it's 70 years old now, and that's where I am today. So David said, well, why on earth eight memories? I started writing in, uh, uh, during my time, I enjoyed writing, uh, particularly, I can, I can write better in English now than I can in Spanish. And I've always been interested in history. I followed Aiden Airways after I left them to go to British Airways, or PEA. And I was also interested in colonialism, because I, you have to understand, 
I've had a bit of an American upbringing in Chile, and we were very aware that we fought for independence from Spain in uh, 1810 to 1818, it took a long time. And I was particularly interested in the influence that uh, major countries like Holland, France, the UK had on the uh, origins and the running of their lands abroad. Keep an eye on the time. And um, so it never was it what it was about. But in fact, colonial airlines didn't really start until after the Second World War. And this gives you an idea of what Belgium, Italy, and KLM did with their airlines. But they were all national airlines. They're not colonized in any way. And this is what Imperial Airways Uh, had in 1939 with Qantas, which was a subsidiary, but with the, with the Australians very keen to take Qantas back. So what we're going to do now is just concentrate a little bit on what happens with uh, uh, the UK during the war to make them want to have colonial airlines. And uh, we're starting with the war. The war started in September 1939. By 19, uh, June 1949, a uh, correction to that, 1940, France had fallen on the 15th of June. On the 10th of June, Italy came into the war, and all of a sudden, the whole of the Mediterranean, all this area here, was closed to uh, civil aviation. And all of North Africa here, Libya was Italian, it was the colony, Ethiopia had been. Uh, colony of Italy, but that had been, uh, the Italians had been kicked out, and Germany uh, occupied uh, all of this part of Africa, Algeria, and uh, Tunisia, and Libya, and Algeria stayed with the French, and the French stayed with the Germans. The French don't always like to admit this, but they had to fight in Algeria and in Syria and defeat the French. And that was the problem. So when BRAC were given some uh, three by three one fours, they were able to open the route, London, Lisbon, Bathurst, Freetown, down to Lagos. And from there, they flew whatever aircraft they could get. Very often, Junkers 52 from Sabina and other airlines, up to Khartoum and then up to Cairo. Cairo was the center of BRAC. Uh, and Durban down in South Africa, other than in London. But the German army came within 60 miles of Cairo on stage. And this is why down in Asmara, which is down here, you'll see shortly, uh, BRAC built their main base, just in case they had to vacate Cairo. You see this blue line here, that is the horseshoe route, and the horseshoe route went all the way from Durban up through Khartoum, round and down to Sydney. And that took 10 days, and it was how they kept the communications so over with the Far East. And as the Japanese invaded, um, the route moved further and further backwards until it was in Colombo in Sri Lanka, or Ceylon in those days. Um, and for this reason, the, uh, the uh, horseshoe route actually came down and flew up that way to avoid all that off the well there. So here I see open the route down to Asmara, which was down here in Eritrea at 6,000 feet, down to Aden, up through the protectorate and the Omar, up to Jawani, which was in India, and now this is in Pakistan. And they prepared all that route just in case uh, Cairo closed. Um, well, uh, as you know, Cairo didn't close and uh, Europe won the war. But um, the big change and the difference was the war threw into the melting pot all of the people's attitudes who once were in the colonies. And that was very important. They no longer wanted to be governed by Britain. And Britain, on the other hand, said, well, actually, we'll do this because we will have 
uh, influence in all these colonial countries will be so good to them that maybe they'll want to stay with us and they'll stay as trading partners. But the resentments have been so much before the war, and particularly towards France and Belgium, that this was really was unviable. But nevertheless, in 1945, um, the colonial office in London said, well, actually, we're going to try something. We're going to set up an airline down here in Aden to look after the Red Sea countries and the development of uh, aviation in the Red Sea. And they decided to set up Aden Airways so in this, 1945. I might interrupt. So this was the very first of the BOAC associate carriers to be established. Correct. Uh, and it wasn't an associate, it was a subsidiary. Uh, associates didn't come in until 1957, and there's a reason for that. But this gives you an idea of the route structure. They had seven DC-3s to start with. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, seven DC-3s to start with, based in uh, Asmara, because in Aden it was too hot and undeveloped. But they flew all the Red Sea countries as far as west as Khartoum, where they met up with West African Airways, which was another subsidiary, and up to Cairo and up to Damascus. They never actually made it to India, and they also went down to Nairobi. But more important, and this is what it's all about, is they opened the protectorate. And the name of the book is called Red Sea Caravan, because in since ancient times, the time uh, when Christ was walking about, um, uh, the, the, uh, the Silk Road came down through uh, this part of Asia, down <coughs> through the uh, uh, Arabian Peninsula, and up to Jeddah or Medina, as it was then. And it was all done by caravan. And the caravan, there were no roads in the protectorate or in the Saudi Desert. And the caravans had to cross tribal areas where sometimes they were murdered, sometimes they had everything taken away from them, but they always had to pay the tolls. By setting up an airline in the protectorate, particularly using Mukairas and Mukama, which I'll talk about briefly, um, they could save all that and all the goods could be transported by air. And it brought quite a lot of wealth to that part of the world. Mukairas, was on the border with Yemen, and I'll show you this in a moment. Mukala was on the coast. It had no roads to it, but it had an airfield at a place called Riyadh, which you'll see here. There is Riyadh over there. Mukala, Mukeras is here, and Mukala was just down here. And uh, Mukala was the great shipbuilding when Sinbad was sailing in the Arabian Sea. That's where he had his ship built. It's that sort of history to this part of the world. Uh, so uh, Aiden Airways opened up the, um, the protectorate for the benefit of the people, and they did a wonderful job. What we're going to show you is uh, Bukala itself, just a couple of slides to show you how ancient it is. Then we'll go up to Mukairas and uh, show you the dangers of flying there, and then the roots, uh, the roots itself. But before we do that, all the DC-3s were beautifully furnished uh, with leather seats. Uh, that was powder blue, uh, powder blue seating for rest of us. You can see the air conditioning systems there, uh, two little fans, and um, that was when the aircraft were new. Sorry. And this is the aircraft in the uh, They had stewardess service. But in fact, the stewardesses only operated on the uh, root structure up to Cairo and places. They weren't allowed into the protectorate. They used stewards there. And the main reason the steward was there was to stop the tri tribesmen who all carried guns, um, uh, carried guns not to have bullets in the breach. And you'll see that in a moment. The airplanes were always used for freight. You can see them carrying a spare engine here. And they also had, uh, they carried the sheep, which were for the food. They kept, they had no fridges up in the protectorate, so they kept the animals alive until they needed to eat them. But of course they had to go in plastic pans because they urinated on the flight. And before that, 
the, uh, the dust from the concrete the bags that they used to carry as freight had sifted down to the control columns. The urine went onto the control rods and the uh, lines, and of course they had lots of control problems. I mean, you've got to think of everything. Um, now, this is Bukhala, just to give you an idea. Very ancient, very beautiful, and there's a caravan going into the city. And this is in the 1940s and 50s, while most of us were still alive. On the other hand, Mokeris, which was up on the border, and I, as I told you, with Yemen, it was the main entrance between the trading route between Yemen and the protectorate itself. But you had to fly up through these gaps because the density altitude with the high temperatures and the great um, high temperatures and humidity meant that even the DC-3s used to struggle. And they used to go up through that pass up to the top there, and here is the runway at Mokeros. Just along there, that's Mokeros itself, and that is North Yemen there. The border ran somewhere along that wadi there. Um, it was always an interesting approach, apparently, and uh, I wouldn't have liked to have done it myself. And there's the meeting party. Everybody carried a rifle. Uh, the 303 rifle, you didn't have to be a soldier, you just had a rifle. It was an indication of your manhood. Sorry. Um, and that's the way of security, don't bother about it. It was wonderful. It was just a wonderful experience to be there with all of that. And Everything went by air, including that Land Rover Jeep. But nobody ever told me how they got it out of there. <laughs> I had to put that one in. But there was a lot of humming and hawing and not a lot of movement. And when you got airborne out of Paris, the company had a policy for engine failure on takeoff. If you were below 80 knots on the takeoff and you had an engine failure, you just brought the aircraft to a halt. If, you, if it was above 80 knots, you lifted the landing gear and slid to a halt. And if you got in with an engine failure, you were in trouble. And if you remember you came up the opposite way in that early photograph? Well, you picked that uh, exit and you flew down the valley. And until you got to the coastline, which is way over in the distance there, and then you flew down the coast of Wayne on the single engine. There was, no, there was nowhere to land. Um, you, you just wouldn't be able to do it. They used to do that in the palace as well. Um, and here we are. This just gives you an idea. A town, I don't know the name of it. Nobody knows the name of it. But it was a town they used to pass quite regularly. Uh, no roads to it, just a caravan trail. This is Shaban. Right in the center of it, uh, it was on the Silk Road. Well, every single house in there is made of mud. And this is landing at Shaban. You just landed on the desert floor there. There was nowhere to go otherwise. And uh, this, this is the center inside the town. They should never have taken these photographs, but they did all these mud houses and large, tall buildings. And Yemen is still the same. And there was the aid man was shot, which I think was quite amazing. And when oil was discovered, the airplanes were used to take all the equipment up into the desert. Everything was flown in, in pieces and built. And everything was flown out except the oil because they had the uh, the pipelines, but all the fuel and the oil for running of the drills and everything else had to be carried in by airplane. Sometimes they did 12 sectors a day, just flying this in from Salama and places like that. The way they found their way in the desert with no radio aids or anything like that, and every bit looked quite similar, was um, uh, they would either fly together in formation or they would just 
go on a, tra on a heading and a track and a distance and a time, land in the desert where they had some uh, space uh, cleared for them, oil poured on the sand so it gave some firmness, and then after that, they would light bonfires so for their tires, and you could see them from about 70 or 80 miles away. There were no winds in the desert. It was pretty basic. As was the, for those of you who are air crew, uh, that was the night stop accommodation in the desert, in temperatures of 40 and 45 degrees centigrade, no air conditioning. Be grateful for today. That was the chief pilot, Vic Spencer, a wonderful man, actually. But it's very easy to forget that it also was an airline. And they operated out of Asmara. They wore proper uniforms um, uh, to fly up there. That's Vic Spencer once again um, here. And but up in the protectorate, this was the uniform they had, which is what all the best people wore, short trousers and long stockings, because you don't want to show your legs. And this is what the people looked like. This is actually taken in Somaliland and completely different. And you just can't see anything other than the desert that they were traveling to. Aid. It was an airline. This is the airline operation now out of uh, Asmara going up to Cairo. Everybody had a proper uniform, they wore hats, and we even had the uh, flags on the top, which is what all the airlines did in those days. This is about 1953. And by the time 1960 came along, Aiden Airways had a reputation for that wasn't very good, because everyone else was operating modern equipment. Well, um, BRAC gave them um, uh, three Argonauts. You can see the Merlin engines. These airplanes were tired say the very least, and were hardly modern. Uh, but nevertheless, they kept the airline going. They lasted three years before they got overcome by corrosion. Aiden was very in humidity of 90%. And, but then this was the flight arriving in Nairobi. Uh, stewardesses here, proper steps, people meeting the airplane, and being their pilots wearing proper uniforms and ties. These are the stewardesses. Um, they were lovely, lovely girls. They joined the airline at 18. Uh, they were usually um, uh, daughters of uh, wealthy merchants or government officials in Aden, and this was a fun job for them. And of course, when I went to interview them for the book, uh, this is what I was expecting, but they were already in their 60s. <laughs> But they're all still alive. They're all, all these three girls are still alive. And uh, we have lunch regularly in September at the Aiden Airways Lunch in London. And uh, they love the book because they, they were recognized as a, as a result. But they're all in their 80s. They're older than me, if that's possible. <laughs> and then in 1965, uh, even the Argonauts had gone by that stage, so they were given three Viscounts. And there was a Viscount 700, they'd come up from Malayan Airways, part of, uh, that was part of the associated uh, companies by then, and they operated in a first-class layout uh, down below here, and a proper full service. And this uh, photograph up here was taken in Nairobi, and you can see there uh, the comet and that is what they were competing with, the Bicam versus the Comet of East African Airways, which gives an idea of what it's about and the problems they had. However, Aiden was overcome with violence and uh, from the Yemen. Some of you will remember the 1956 invasion of the Suez Canal by France and England and Israel, and this gave Nasser the right, he felt, to foment trouble up in the Yemen against Aden and anything British. And in fact, the PLF, the Popular Liberation Front, and another uh, faction similarly named were fighting in uh, Aden. It was very unsafe. This was in 1966-67. And the Wilson government in Great Britain decided they were going to pull out of all the colonies. 
and uh, they said that in June 1967, you can have it all back. Well, normally this would have uh, decreased the violence, in fact, it increased it. And Aden um, lost all their passengers, security was very difficult, and the last day, which was the 7th of June in 1967, their one remaining Viscount was blown up on the pan. It had been in maintenance, and then the policy was to have it isolated for 24 hours, and on the 23rd hour, the bomb went off. And it was quite clear that the bomb had been placed in it during its maintenance schedule. This was isolated and guarded by soldiers. And that was on the last day, and I think in some ways this epitomizes what was going on in the world in those days politically. And it was the end of Aden Airways, I think one of the best airlines uh, from a colonial point of view there ever was. But British Airways did try, or well, sorry, the OAC did try, because this Aden Airways was so successful that they tried to set up colonial airlines in Hong Kong. And uh, for instance, they set it up in East Africa. East African Airways started as a similar airline to um, Aden Airways. It was quite successful, but quite successful only. Hey, I'm sorry, you, you mentioned in 1957, they transformed from subsidiary I'm sorry. to associate carriers. Yes, you're quite right. Um, in 1957, they could not call them subsidiary airlines anymore. They could see the writing on the wall, particularly with the Caribbean airlines, and you'll see photographs of them in a minute, uh, such as Bahamas Airways, BWE, British West Indian, Guyana Airways. And um, they realized that they would have to make them associate companies. They would have support from the OAC but uh, they would not belong to the OAC. They were part of the uh, accounting system, but they didn't, and the big mistake in my view was that they didn't belong to the colonies that uh, were, they were flying in, such as Aiden Airways had. And uh, Associated Airways was set up in 1937, but it led the company dry. Apart from uh, Malayan Airways, uh, where a profit was made all the time. Um, Aiden Airways made a profit most of the time until they were made by uh, an airline called Arab Airways up in Jordan. The OAC didn't want to know about it, but they forced Aiden Airways to buy Arab Airways and uh, Jordan Airways as well. So this was the problem, and the associated companies became the albatross around the company's name. I've gotten the 10-minute signal. From I'm sorry? I've gotten the 10-minute signal from Sarah, so... How are we doing the time? <laughs> Fast. Right. I'm just going to show you some of the airlines that operated them. East African Airways. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, East African Airways here operated the DC-3s. And here you have Guyana Airways. Um, I love these photographs. And then Hong Kong Airways. Where, where else would that be, those people going on board there? But Hong Kong Airways got the spare Viscount from uh, Aiden Airways. And uh, the problem there was the civil war in China in 1949. There was nowhere to go. And the people in the government of Hong Kong said, we don't want a subsidiary of BOAC. Malayan Airways, that went very well, and turned into Singapore Airlines for whom I flew. Malayan Airways again, lovely air, the aircraft. It's done by. And then West African Airways, the old Bristol 170 that flew across Africa and took two days about it, flew at 130 knots, had very few seats, had seats at the back, but no seats in the middle here, and they sat on the floor. That turned into Nigerian Airways and eventually uh, became independent. British West Indian Airways, based in Trinidad, um, became independent again, lost uh, British Airways, or BOAC, a great deal of money. Bahamas Airways, DC-3, but they operated the Catalina. 
and which airlines were in the, in the 1940s and 50s operating Catalinas, apart from in uh, different parts of the Far East. The Bahamas Airways Viscount, the Viscount was handed to everybody. But that was the end, and actually, this is why I put this slide in. It's the end, it was the end of the colonial period. And that, to me, epitomizes the good, the altruism that Aiden Airways did, and the good it did in the protectorate. And I just think that's a beautiful photograph, uh, and really is the very much the good night. Thank you. I didn't join them. Oh, you didn't? No. Um, BEA, um, I joined them, but I had not signed the contract, and they would have released me. They were very kind to me. Um, ten days before I was due to fly to Aiden to uh, get time breaking on the DC-3, BEA rang me up and said, we take foreigners now. Oh. So long as you're going to be kind Okay. But he did interview all the staff. I mean, it's amazing just to... Uh, relationship you have with the company now? Well, um, yes, they, they were very generous to me. Um, and apart from the initial suspicion, um, I just went to the archives every day, four or five days a week. They let me go through everything. And um, uh, some of the paperwork was quite sensi sensitive. I made a promise not to divulge the sensitive issues, um, particularly when the aircraft, one aircraft was blown up in flight, um, that was uh, quite an issue. I'll talk about it uh, separately, if you like. But um, they were very generous, and I built up, as David says, this very close relationship with the British Airways archives. And I've given several other talks and lectures as a result of the help they always give me. And the other thing was Vic Spencer had kept a meticulous logbook. Uh, of his time there, and diaries, which were once again very sensitive, and also all his photographs. And he died just as the book was about to be published, and uh, that's why the book is dedicated to Big Spencer. So, Dave, I have a question. Were you able to negotiate a higher salary after you went to, you know, after said to me, I'm not going to come, but I'll be a in BEA. No, I started on eight hundred pounds a year and I was told how, how lucky I was. And I was taxed. I used to take home forty pounds a month. Ten pounds a week, fifteen dollars a week. I know my my father looked at me and said, You really want to be an airline pilot? <laughs> it did change. <laughs> no, I think I think it, it was sensible, actually, uh, Scott. I think if I'd done that, um, the pilots from Aiden Airways after it closed down um, were all offered jobs with BRAC, but a lot of them were renegades and uh, people running away from something. To give you an idea, when the airplane was blown up, tell me, sir, if I'm running out of time, uh, when the airplane was blown up in the, in the, uh, in the sky, it was the son of one of the sheikhs who was on board the airplane, and he was trying to hurry on the succession. Um, but the two pilots, um, uh, one was brand new, and after about five months, the chief pilot got a letter from somebody in Australia saying, look, um, my husband has stopped sending me money. Uh, could you tell me what's going on? Well, it was a bigamous marriage, because he was already married in the UK. And he told this girl in Australia, who's married to her, and children, was sending a salary to Australia, but nobody told her, of course, that he'd been killed. <laughs> I know. Uh, there, there were some strange people there. I don't think it would have been a good career for to stay there, any more than it would have been to go back to Chile. Uh, whenever I went back to Chile to visit my parents, I used to talk to a lot of the man guys, and they said, whatever you do, don't come. Um, it was a good move. 
British Airways, BEA, BOAC, British Airways have been very, very good to me. They were the ideal and wonderful employer. These Aiden Airways reunions, did you talk about how many people show up for them? Um, about 10 on our table, but it's all the people who are in Aiden anyway. Uh, but they all bought the book. The book got sold out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.